Welcome to the Cancer Solar Festival webinar of the 2025 initiative, Building Material Conditions for Manifestation of the Plan. Our guests today are Daniel Hersesen from Switzerland. Hi, Daniel. Hi, Alexander. Welcome and thank you very much for focusing our work today and bringing our attention to this important aspect of the work of manifesting the plan. So the floor is yours and please share with us. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thank you Alexander for inviting me to speak. It's a great privilege and um, to speak with everyone today. So before I start, just one comment. For the sake of simplicity and to avoid repetition, when I refer to men, I of course mean both men and women, so no uh, discrimination is intended. Every human being is placed it's in a specific the time on. on our planet Earth, in which he must find his way, whatever that way may be. He is exposed to his environment, which conditions him and imposes upon him a pressure to act. A pressure to find a mode of living which can sustain him within his environment. And he strives to do this in a way which accords with his instincts and desires. Over time, the environment has changed from that of raw nature to that of human civilization. And with it, the nature of the pressures placed upon him by his environment has changed. Today, he finds himself born into a nation, race, religion, and social class within an environment preeminently of humanity's own construction. Humanity is no longer comprised of scattered sprinklings of isolated populations. It has become a global interconnected living system, which is constantly adapting under the pressure of its own misconstruction. A misconstruction which engenders internal struggles for betterment, for human system which both sustains and develops all within it. Man finds himself somewhere within this system and finds himself caught up within the human struggle in some form or another. Still, he needs to find a mode of living which can sustain him, but he struggles in vain to fulfill his desires, which he now realizes do not lead to enduring satisfaction. His reaction to his sensitive, emotion-feeling nature has awakened his, his mind. He realizes his beliefs are contradictory and irrational and do not accord with his experience of life, with his common sense. He sees the bias and prejudice of his nation, religion, and social groups, and how the pursuit of self-interest by individuals, groups, and nations is weaving selfish threads of cause and effect into great knots of conflict within the tapestry of humanity. He awakens to I apologize, Daniel. Um, I, sorry, the sound, uh, your sound is not very loud. Uh, can, can you get closer to the microphone? Is that better? Yes, it's better. Thank you. Okay. Um, um, he, he sees the bias and prejudice of his nation, religion, and social groups, and how the pursuit of self-interest by individuals, groups, and nations is weaving selfish threads of cause and effect into great knots of conflict within the tapestry of humanity. He awakens to the real issues of life, he realizes that for human civilization to function effectively and justly, he must begin to contribute his part, not only to its sustaining, but also to its adaptation, to the correction of past errors in construction to which all have been party, to change the human attitudes which have led to such devastating knots of conflict. He begins to participate consciously in the struggle to rebuild and reorganize humanity in a way which will enable a free flow of human life from the inner worlds of purpose and pure reason to the outer world of money and organized human activity. He has become an instrument of the will to good through whom goodwill flowers forth in his environment. The life which flows through all things and which provides the impulse behind everything we do needs to be mastered within the collective consciousness of humanity, a consciousness which is currently very disparate in terms of the quality of its response to this life force. We are all familiar with the various expressions of this life force as it impacts different aspects of the human constitution. 
physical urges, emotional desires, purposive will to good, irresistibly moving us to act in one way or another according to our degree of mastery of this life force. The new group of world servers, the expression of unity within the collective consciousness of humanity, is currently insufficiently powerful to purposively control and direct the life force coursing through humanity, which is predominantly focused in the emotional nature and which finds expression a selfish desire acting in direct opposition to unity and the laws of life. Mistakes as to the laws of life result in all the problems confronting humanity. We see, for example, the effect of selfish desire on the flow of money within humanity, money being the physical expression of the life force within humanity. The various mechanisms which move money within humanity are predominantly driven by desire expressing self-interest and not by the will to good expressing unity. Economic injustice is the result. The laws of our system are the condition of unity and their source is found in the unity of life. They may be divided into two parts, the laws of nature governing matter and motion and the laws of life governing consciousness. The laws of nature are imposed on humanity, which has learned that in order to derive material benefit from scientific knowledge, it must create technologies which work in accordance with the laws of nature. In contrast, the laws of life are not imposed upon humanity. The wisdom can only be recognized and eventually appropriated as an effect of life's experiences. While we do not have the time to review the laws of life, we shall recall that they are the embodiment of the will to good. Three of these laws are of particular relevance to this talk, the law of unity, the law of cause and effect, and the law of freedom. This brings us to problem peculiar to humanity, which concerns freedom of choice, a question which has plagued philosophers down the ages. We do not have the time to go into the age-old philosophical debate as to whether man has freedom of choice or not, but what we can say is that mankind makes mistakes in a way which is unknown both in the subhuman kingdoms, where there is no choice due to the absence of mind, and in the spiritual kingdom, where choice is always based on complete knowledge and perspective and in alignment with planetary purpose. You might maintain that to make a mistake involves freedom of choice, but would we rationally choose to make a mistake, or do we rather get swept into making mistakes because we do not understand or master the forces acting upon and through us? It seems that humanity is the kingdom of error, or rather, it is the kingdom in which the laws of life are to be consciously learned and mastered through the process of trial and error. At this point, we might be justified in asking why the evolutionary process forces humanity through the painful process of discovering the laws of life in the crucible of human experiment and experience. This is a multifaceted question, but the aspect I would like to focus on is the evolutionary necessity to develop a divine quality able to implement the timeless, spaceless idea of unity in the world of diversified form. This divine quality must learn how to optimally relate all form activity across the dimension of space and around the axis of time. This quality is the human intellect, an aspect of the divine, third divine quality of intelligence and humanity's contribution to that triplicity of qualities, will, love and intelligence, needed to implement divine purpose in time and space. The intellect is necessarily the product of much painful experimentation and experience as individuals, groups, and nations within humanity test out all selfish possibilities of human relationship and organization as each seeks to achieve its separative desire-based goals. After much life experience, the growing intellect enables man to relate effects back to their originating causes, to see alternative and ever greater perspectives, and to think in terms of systems within ever greater systems. He then sees the need for parts within such systems to cooperate and not compete, to work towards systemic purpose and not towards conflicting individual interests. He finally recognizes that the laws of life are the laws which perfectly govern the development of the part in relationship with the whole, and that the laws of life are incomparably superior to the selfish little laws which have hitherto governed his way and which have led him from misery to misery. The great lesson which humanity must learn is that it can only attain harmony and peace when it has learned to function in accordance with the laws of the system 
in which we live and move and have our being. The history of humanity may be told in terms of its frustrated attempts at building enduring civilizations on the basis of human laws and principles not fit for this purpose. Today we can observe how nation states struggle to, fill, to fulfill the material needs of the world population within a global economic system which has not been designed to achieve economic justice. A world economic system is based on competition which means that the world's wealth necessarily gravitates to the winners in the system and the laws of inheritance ensure that wealth is accumulated within elite families from generation to generation. We know that all of the problems of humanity are, humanity are evolutionary but in order to know the next evolu evolutionary step we need to understand the evolutionary status of humanity. The Tibetan tells us that a fairly large minority are becoming group conscious while the, whilst the majority are emerging from out of the mass conscious stage and are becoming self-conscious individuals. This accounts for much of the world difficulty and for the clash of idealisms. The two groups bring a different approach to the world problems as we now find them. In our modern day, the same division defines two great opposing streams of consciousness within humanity. On the one hand, there is a small band of separative world leaders who collectively focus their will to power in the integrated personality of humanity's lower nature, corrupting all ideals to serve a ruling elite which controls the masses through physical force and tyranny of emotion and thought. Interestingly, it is the collective greed and ignorance of the masses which has made possible the ambition of this band of leaders to control money and men through their architected power systems. However, the corrupt ideology of these leaders is leading to an e increasing economic divide and growing dissatisfaction, frustration and anger amongst the masses who are rebelling against the institutions which, rather than representing them, attempt to manipulate and control them through intellectual propaganda and biased media coverage. The recent US presidential election and Brexit are both illustrative of this anger and frustration. On the other hand, we have the new group of world servers who collectively evoke the Shambhala force through their will to good, focusing it in the light of humanity's soul, evoking goodwill in the masses and offsetting the will to power. The Tibetan tells us that the will to good is the father aspect whilst goodwill is a mother aspect, and from the relation of these two, the new civilization, based on sound spiritual but utterly different lines, can be founded. In this context, it is interesting to note that the consciousness of the men and women of goodwill is focused in the higher emotional nature, which is governed by the law of attraction. These men and women can therefore be united into one powerful, cohesive global group. It is in this expanding group that the future of humanity lies. The Tibetan tells us that the tendencies of the separative forces will be neutralized by the fixed intention of the men and women of goodwill to work for the good of the whole and not for any one part. In contrast, the remainder of the masses, the vast majority, are focused in the lower emotional nature, which is governed by the law of repulsion, hence the prevalence of fear and hatred and the predilection for ideologies which optimize personal freedom and self-interest. Central to the distinction between the two streams of human consciousness is the understanding of the concept of freedom. To be free is the natural state of man, but what freedom truly means becomes clouded while incarnation. Learning that freedom is conformance with the laws of life and not the yielding to the arbitrary whims of desire is the riddle of free will which each of us has to solve for him or herself. Law is in fact the very condition of freedom because without law we have chaos and the rule of all against all. The law of freedom implies an equal right to freedom of all which necessarily delimits individual and group freedom to that which does not encroach upon the freedom of other individuals and groups. Respect and tolerance are essential ingredients to a true expression of freedom. Contrast this notion of freedom with a notion of freedom upon which our capitalist free market world economy has been built. Individual and corporate freedom to exploit market opportunity for unlimited personal gain in an environment in which productivity and price efficiency are established under the law of competition. When humanity, humanity deliberately sets all against all 
as opposed to making them all feel responsible for all, do we really have to wonder why humanity is analogous to an immense cauldron of diverse elements each reacting upon the other in an often explosive manner? Until we liberate ourselves from our false notions of freedom, which is the belief that we are exercising our freedom when we yield to the blind and selfish impulses of desire, we will continue to err in our choices, simply because selfishness sees its own freedom as more important than anyone else's. This is the evolutionary problem confronting the masses, the material units within humanity. This collective ignorance, greed and separativeness plays into the hands of that band of world leaders who direct and control the masses by whatever expedient means is available. The result is a mass encroachment by aggressive individuals, groups and nations upon the freedom of others. And this causes conflict and systemic imbalance within humanity. This sets in motion forces to reestablish equilibrium. This force is the will to good, evoked by the enlightened part of humanity as a consequence of being confronted with the horrors of its own making. Today's migrant crisis is a case in point. Disequilibrium within the system of humanity has caused a flow of people from certain geographic zones to other geographic zones. The cause of this problem may be, to a large extent be traced back to the West, to the errors of exploitation, to war, and to the failure of the West to realize its responsibility towards developing nations. All altruistic endeavors recognize this responsibility and attempt to address the imbalance caused by the world system we have established. We can see this in the way in which charities and NGOs selflessly strive to correct the egregious economic injustice caused by the world economic and monetary systems. The rapid global integration of humanity, expedited by technology, is causing an acceleration of change, which equates to an acceleration of evolution. As a consequence, the effects of all errors as to the laws of life are rapidly being brought to the surface of the collective human consciousness, where real and not pseudo-solutions to human problems are being demanded. Change is, of course, the condition of life. But the particular type of change which humanity is experiencing is that of the mutable cross, the cross of change, which will continue to force the adaptation of humanity until its internal organization and processes permit a free circulation of energy throughout the system, such that supply is mobilized to meet true demand on the physical plane. Interestingly, it is the constellation of cancer which conditions the mass psychology and response of humanity. Mass response is basically the focusing of a mass will through the medium of the mass consciousness. We see the effect of this in public opinion, which is the focused expression of mass consciousness based on some sort of ideal and motivated by some expression of desire, a desire which is gradually being ennobled by the evolutionary process. In this context, we should note that public opinion is being educated often by misleading propaganda, but increasingly by diverse media and public debates, uncontrolled by political and business agendas. As the integrity of this education improves and becomes more honest, constructive and inclusive, we can look forward to an enlightened public opinion which will become increasingly difficult to manipulate. The Piscean Age has been characterized by authority and control, and much of the current world unrest may be ascribed to the frantic attempt by the elite in power to retain this mode of governing human thought and activity. The masses have been controlled by the leaders of the race through the force of their claimed authority over religion and ideals which a sixth ray has brought them in touch with. The Aquarian age will see this reversed. The positions of authority and control of the people will be and are being transmuted into positions of service to the people. The notion of service is being anchored in the human brain by the seventh ray. It is on the lips of politicians, businessmen, and world servers alike. We are told that the Aquarian age will be predominantly one of the unfoldment of group consciousness and emphasis, and that selfishness, as we now understand it, will gradually disappear, for the will of the individual will voluntarily be blended in the group will. This could well bring about a still more dangerous situation, because a group would be a combination of focused energies and unless these energies are directed towards the fulfillment of the plan, we shall have the gradual consolidation of the forces of evil or materialism on earth. We also need to bear in mind that the seventh ray is a ray of order, and if wrongly applied, can equally lead to imposed control over the masses. To quote the Tibetan, 
This ray of order and its incoming is partially responsible for the present tendency in world affairs toward governmental dictatorship and the imposed control of a central governing body. We see, therefore, that the Aquarian Age and the Seventh Ray will not automatically bring with them better world conditions. They will bring those conditions which the predominant consciousness of humanity precipitates. The new group of world servers and men and women of goodwill therefore need to work relentlessly towards the vision of a civilization based on a unified humanity. Hence the urgent need to offset any, any tendencies which stand in opposition to unity by evoking the Shambhala force through the collective will to good. While the collective consciousness of humanity is beginning to acknowledge that humanity functions as a, functions as a single entity, only a very small part of humanity realizes or accepts as a hypothesis that humanity is a unity in consciousness. It is only since the inception of the United Nations in 1945, following two world wars, that has been any really real attempt at global unification. This process of unification is immensely difficult to accomplish on the physical plane, as unity stands in direct opposition to our entrenched global systems of competing individuals, organizations, and nations. Hence the many crises, crises we are experiencing. However, the possibility that humanity is going through a major psychological crisis as a single psychological entity is only just entering the consciousness of those who think in terms of the one humanity. In fact, we can clearly see humanity's higher nature, as embodied by the new group of world servers and the men and women of goodwill, unitedly driven by the will to good, standing in direct conflict with humanity's personality, as embodied by those men and women of authority and control who are driven by the will to power over the unenlightened masses. New cycles of being and consciousness are initiated by such conflicts, and if humanity emerges victorious from this conflict, we can expect the primary focus of human consciousness to shift away from material growth and towards spiritual growth. Victory depends on the successful evocation of the Shambhala force through the massed will to good. It becomes evidently clear as to what is needed to strengthen the hands of the new group of world servers as it works through the United Nations and the allied groups of goodwill in its mission to unify, human unify humanity in the face of an upsurge in nationalism. This upsurge is just the immediate short-sighted reaction of the masses to the increasing transparency of world conditions and a misunderstanding as to working out of the law of cause and effect. Realization and understanding of what is happening still needs to dawn in their consciousness. It is the work of the new group of world servers to shine the light of insight and understanding into public opinion via uncorrupted world thinkers thereby dispelling ignorance of law and aiding in the struggle against the tyranny of thought. As this process proceeds over the coming decades, and the number of people who think in terms of unity and the well-being of humanity as a whole increases, we can expect nationalism to decline and true statesmen, as opposed to politicians, be elected into power, who will become servants of the people in the true Aquarian sense. Then President Lincoln's words in his Gettysburg Address government of the people, by the people, for the people, will take on a true and global significance. The UN, or whatever form it will later take, will then step into power in terms of its ability to unify humanity through a system of global governance empowered by a truer democratic process made possible by an increasingly enlightened global public opinion. In this context, it's, it is interesting to note that Noam Chomsky, referred to by the New York Times as arguably the most important intellectual alive, has stated that global public opinion is a potential second super superpower, as it already demonstrated in its mass opposition to the US invasion of Iraq. We see, therefore, the urgent need to educate this public opinion al along the lines of the new ideals. So what does all this mean in terms of practical service from the perspective of the aspirants and disciples of the world? Firstly, we must recall that this is a group work, and that is, it is only through the massed aspirational desire of the men and women of goodwill, and that includes all of us, that the will to good can be invoked. When the will to good is focused sufficiently powerfully through the new group of world servers, it will become possible to bend the personality of humanity into an instrument of planetary goodwill. When considering the relationship between the new group of world servers and the men and women of goodwill, 
We should not think of the new group of world service as one polar extreme and the men and women of goodwill as the other polar extreme. There is one continuum of human life and human consciousness, unified in orientation and by the one work, but motivated by an individual vision of the unique part each plays. Each human being have a unique, having a unique life history and hence a unique part to play as we piece together our understanding and work towards the living realization of planetary purpose. When considering the relationship between the new group of world servers and the men and women of goodwill, the disciple should recognize the corresponding relationship within his own constitution. He needs to learn to connect with and focus the will to good through his own soul, such that goodwill can flower forth through his personality. He is then both a member of the new group of world servers, working through his soul on the mental plane, and a man of goodwill, working through his personality on the physical plane. He then connects hierarchy with humanity within himself, and in so doing enables greater light to pour into humanity. The two factors which have precipitated world conditions are ignorance and greed, which is lower desire. And these are broadly speaking the two principal problems that need to be solved within humanity. So how do the new group of world servers and the men and women of goodwill go about practically dispelling ignorance and reorienting human desire? We know that addressing the problem of ignorance has to do with liberating the masses from the false conceptions and beliefs on which they base their various modes of living. The philo philosophical and scientific fictions of the mental plane need to be replaced with thoughts, concepts, and systems of knowledge which accord with the reality and the laws of life. And the separative religious and sectarian dogmas of the emotional plane need to be replaced with the notion of a single unifying religion and associated principles with its multi, multiple cultural aspects. It follows that aspirants and disciples need to learn to think in accordance with reality and the laws of life. The esoteric knowledge system provided by the spiritual hierarchy, prim primarily by the Tibetan, and perhaps best summarized by Henry T. Lawrence. Then the collective thoughts which the aspirants and disciples create will coalesce through mutual resonance into powerful thought forms which on the one hand make it easier for seekers to grasp esoteric ideas, and on the other hand influence the thinkers of the world as they work out the new ideals that will reshape human civilization. Greater power and clarity on the mental plane will help to bring clarity to the emotional plane to reorganize the emotional belief system along more rational and inclusive lines. This will also facilitate the shift in consciousness from the higher emotional nature to the mind. In a more general sense, all thoughts and acts which work towards unifying humanity are thoughts and acts of service. This ranges from the directing of thought currents on the mental plane to improving living conditions on the physical plane. The work is one, the service on the plane of thought working out a service on the physical plane. Addressing the greed in the world involves an interplay between the new group of world servers and the men and women of goodwill on the one hand and the masses on the other hand. It represents, in a very real sense, the group work of saving, of raising the consciousness of the material units within humanity from out of the materiality of the lower emotional nature and into the light of a brighter vision which the higher emotional nature enables them to grasp. This is why it is so important to love your enemies, because without this ability it is impossible to reach the masses of men with truth and goodwill and to initiate their reorientation. The pollution of the lower emotional atmosphere to which we have all contributed results in self-perpetuating antagonism, making it very difficult for the masses to lift themselves into an emotionality of attraction. It is the effect of the men and women of goodwill walking amongst the masses, expressing goodwill in all human contexts and never allowing themselves to sink into the lower emotionality, we all know what this is, which breaks the hateful chains of cause and effect, improves the emotional climate, and gradually ennobles the masses. We should realize that each time we succeed in our environment to lift human consciousness out of the mire of materiality, we are aiding in some small way the one work. It is the accumulation of such, such small acts by the men and women of goodwill across the world which will help to tip the scales in favor of the forces of light. Thank you.
Alex, over to you. Thank you, Daniel. We will, I suggest we have a moment of silence to reflect on your sharing. And after that, we would open the microphone for further reflections from the audience and questions. We invite the audience to, to step in into the sharing and in order to speak, please raise your hand and we will unmute you or otherwise you can uh, use the question section of your control panel uh, to write your comments and questions. Thank you very much, Daniel. It was a very inspiring and a very positive presentation. It indicates how we can be actively uh, supporting the uh, anchoring of light on the planet. So thank you very much. Thank you. And that was uh, uh, René Figueret? René Figueret from Montreal. I want to bring our uh, reflection further and as we are now in this uh, working in, under the energies of the Cancer full moon, one of the keynotes of this uh, sign is building a lighted house. And if we think about the lighted house of the new civilization, it's somewhat demystifies uh, the the idea of uh, hierarchy coming to earth because it brings the idea of our actual um, deeds and our own involvement into that and so I uh, wanted to ask you Daniel about some when you speak to um, people around you, to your friends or to your audiences uh, who are not familiar with the language of uh, esotericism. How um, do you see the receptivity to the idea of the new civilization and how uh, people respond to this idea of uh, emerging of the spiritual, um, spiritually based civilization? 
Um, no, normally, when I when I speak to people from from the business world or people who I don't know so well, I always talk in terms of evolution and the evolutionary process, and try to bring their attention to how evolution has progressed and how humanity has progressed also over time. And um, one of the things I, I usually try and test out quite early on is is um, how they respond to the idea of reincarnation, because that's uh, central um, to having a rational understanding of reality. It, it explains so many more things that um, a single life appearance, which um, Western uh, Christian dogma preachers um, can't explain. So I think um, if they are open to that, and a lot of people are are not particularly religious in, in the business world, so they, and they have um, well-developed minds, and so they're often open to these sorts of things and uh, intellectually interested in, in listening to them. So I've had quite some interesting uh, discussions with, with uh, people in, in the business world. Um, it's, it's actually very encouraging um, because, as we know, uh, human beings unfold differently. Uh, and, and people who tend to go in, in, into, the, into the direction of business um, have, have more that the mind um, aspect um, opening and, and not necessarily the heart aspect so much. And, and so I think once, once the heart aspect opens within a lot of these business people, I think we'll have a, a, a tremendous force for good uh, in the world. And, I, and I'm quite encouraged with, with um, the experiences that I've made. Having, having said that, at the top of corporate, um, corporate uh, entities, um, it is r really like um, a shark feeding frenzy. It, it is quite terrible how, um, how some of these corporate executives behave. So we have, we have everything in the world, and, and we know that as members of, or, or as aspirants and di disciples, that um, our role is is to help transmute to transmute that part of humanity um, which, which doesn't yet see, see the light, so to speak. We know that greed is one of the barriers on bringing the new civilization, and how. Uh, do you see this transformation of often collective greed based on individual greed? How does that transformation happen in, in the corporate world? How the idea of cooperation uh, can supersede the idea of uh, own benefit? Just one second. So um, yeah, the, the corporate world is, is um, so companies in the corporate world are caught within a system. So it's very difficult for one company to act differently than, than the laws governing the system. But what we do see in the business world is this idea of co-opetition, which is cooperative um, competition, where traditional competitors start to uh, create agreements um, in certain areas of business to, to pursue interests in common. So that's one interesting development that we see. The, un, the other interesting development we see is uh, the notion of ecosystems within the corporate world. So companies are recognizing that in this fast-changing dynamic world, it's very difficult to make it on your own. So every company now develops an ecosystem with its key suppliers, supply chains, and, and, and customers, etc., et and business partners, um, to, to actually address address the market. So they're very interesting ideas, but um, still within within companies you see a lot of competition between individuals, uh, but you also see a lot of tremendous teamwork um, also happening. So you see everything happening and I think within companies you get the same cross-section within humanity as, as you get anywhere else. So you get people who are very frustrated with, with the way corporations 
uh, behave, um, but that's partially because they don't understand that there's forces uh, acting on the corporation which make it very hard for those corporations to change. So you see in that really the, the connection between the whole world system and how it functions. And it's hard to imagine how that world system can change um, from the inside out because it's the outer system which govern, governs all the components with it. And as we know, that outer system is, is very much driven by, by competition and greed. And, and when you think of greed, you, you think of um, anyone who holds shares, for example, has um, the expectation to, to get a yield or return on that share. And that is exactly the expectation which drives corporate behavior and drives that corporate behavior to, to cost co costs um, which, which have devastating effect on the lives of, of employees who lose their jobs. So you see the connection of all these things and the, the way I see it is, is that it's really through um, educating and enlightening public opinion that we will eventually change uh, this world system. As I also mentioned in my talk, it's really the, the greed of the masses which feeds the limitless greed of, of, of those, uh, that elite group of uh, human beings who really control the, the, the money and, and the business in the world. I think you bring a very important point, in fact, that these are the masses that have the power, in fact. And uh, more and more, we see a disconnect between the, the heads of the corporations and uh, even their employees, as you mentioned. And more yes. and more, is causing difficulties within the companies themselves, themselves. But how do you see that us little people that feel very often disempowered and powerless in front of all of it, how can we really cooperate or participate to change that public opinion or at least make the public becoming aware that they have the power, in fact. Yeah, well, well when you say the public opinion has, has power, it, it, it is true, but the masses who are focused really in the low emotional nature, they're very separative, right? So you can't get them, while they're separative, you can't get them into a cohesive group. And you only have power if you can create this cohesion. So it's really in when the people um, evolve into the higher emotional nature where the law of attraction is the governing law, then you can get this group cohesion. You can get people to, to create worldwide groups, world, worldwide actions and worldwide movements. And it, it's that that's, that's very interesting. And I think it's that that um, has to be the focus of our attention. So yes, um, a lot of people become despondent because they think they feel helpless. But I think um, you feel helpless when you think of yourself as an individual. And I think it's important to realize that it's, it's group work. And as soon as you realize it's group work, um, it's, it's very empowering. I mean, this group that, that's um, collected today, that, that's um, people, who like-minded people, um, who, who want to do good in the world and who want to change the world. And just by the fact that we get together, we, we think and create thought forms which, which, which will go out there, which will coalesce with similar thought forms and which create a pool of energy that others tap into and, and, and get influenced by. So I think it's, it's very much our work is throughout the chain. So everyone on this phone on this on this call will, will be at a slightly different level of development they'll have different backgrounds different interests different motivations and and so that that in itself determines how they can help within humanity and it's only really in general in the general sense it's it's the goodwill that you radiate and you demonstrate in your environment which is contagious to all um, and which can ripple through humanity. So the smallest acts can have a knock-on effect as it ripples out through humanity, and you have no idea where that ends. It could snowball in, into, into tremendous things. We just don't have the vision to see that. So I think we just need to be positive and have those positive thoughts and realize that as we, as we think along positive lines and think about improvements and, and how humanity um, can move into into the new age um, that really aids in, in the work 
Um, well, my name is Wendy Glaubitz. I have a question. Um, do you have uh, examples where that dynamic has actually happened, um, that people that were concerned somehow formed a group that had some kind of influence, at, uh, large or small? Well, well, I mean, I mean, you only have to look at um, all of the activist groups in the world. I mean, you only need to look at the the environment is 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 a good example. So you can see how people rally around that and how much pressure there is on on uh, coming from the masses to do something about the environment. So that's that's one example. The other example I gave was the mass reaction to to the war in Iraq, and and um, you know you know the if you think about what happened in the U.S. with with the the, the Don, Donald Trump election, if you think, and that's create um, had the effect on on the world, um, the world now wonders what sort of people the 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 U.S. people are. But if you consider, had the Democratic Party been a cohesive group, then Bernie Sanders um, may well be the president now. So, and, and that would have given the whole world. Uh, a very different impression of the U.S. people than they have today, and and Bernie Sanders, he could have made it without the without the corporate funds, without the media support, and without the corporate backing. So I think that in itself shows um, the awakening of 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 the masses w w within the U.S. I, you know, I, I tend not to want to focus on the fact that they elected Donald Trump. I just see that now as a catalyst to to um, accelerate change in the US um, and so I, I don't even see that as necessarily disastrous I, I just think it's going to create faster and greater reaction from from not just the US people but from from the whole world uh, I will unmute Katya. yes uh, hi can you and um, uh, Katya Kaufman and it's interesting to me because, you know, following your thought is like, okay, this group of people that half of the country that elected Donald Trump will get the result. And they will see within four years what actually it led to. And how does it look like the person that they thought could, you know, help the country. And I believe it honestly, they wanted certain issues to be addressed. And um, they, they will have their, you know, their um, experience and our experience mm -hmm. and it is it, it is normal I mean because no matter what the polarization between people who are on the level of you know we want to see a person like Donald Trump and as a head of a country and <laughs> funny enough as a leader of the free world right so mm -hmm. then the free world gets, gets the moment to actually look and see like how does it look like Donald Trump leads it you know and and but to me this whole idea it's the possibility of we of rethinking and adjusting or uh, the thought forms of how that's it's how it's supposed to look it's the same thing when you were talking about um, when you were talking about the greed and profit and <clears throat> yield you know, for the longest time now, I'm thinking about uh, that those thought forms need to be adjusted because all the ideas are pretty old. And I see those old thought forms basically bouncing, trying to get the life <laughs> before it's too late. Because, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, what do you think? Yeah. Sorry? Yes, yes. Over to you. <laughs> yeah. Um... You know, I think if we could see the emotional world, we'd see the extent of the pollution in there. And if you think about the masses who live in, the, in that emotional late, uh, nature, it's, it's like living in a swamp. Um, and they're constantly been bombarded with, with, these, um, with these forms on, on the emotional plane, which makes it very difficult for them to, to escape it. And that's why I wanted to emphasize that the, the people of goodwill can raise those people through through their acts of, of goodness and through their act through through also, also through their radiation, right? Um, and and act, but acts of goodwill that that can really raise raise thoughts and help them help lift them out of that that swamp. 
I, I see that as really important, just getting rid of dispersing that, that emotional um, swamp in which, in which they're stuck. Because it, it is self-perpetuating, because it's really these causal chains uh, of anger, reaction, reaction, reaction. To, it's a constant uh, hateful chain of, of events, um, and they have to be broken. Uh, and it's very hard for, for these people to break that, because they're in it. Uh, and, and, and so it requires others to help them uh, to break that and to break those destructive uh, uh, chains of cause and effect. Mm -hmm. Thank and you. you. I mean, you see that in, in the Middle East, in, in the whole um, Palestinian problem. It, it's just this endless chain of cause and effect, um, which does require um, external interve intervention for the, for the same reason, because there's so much hatred there um, because of the history and you, you have to you have to get out of that somehow but that external intervention is it supposed to be a thought for a new way how to solve that because there's an old way you know old pattern karmic you know pattern mm -hmm. and then so what do we bring in what do we what do we precipitate like what do we manifest in the light of cancer which is, you know, thought forms going into manifestation, going into matter. Well, well I, I think um, to, to, to me, it's the, it's, the thought, it's the thought of unity. I think that's, that's the, most, the most powerful thought. And, and I think the thought of unity, if, if you think along, always along those lines, um, you're thinking also in accordance with, with reality because there is a unity of life. There, there is one life. And if you think along those lines, uh, you're already creating thought forms which which are inclusive and and help to overcome barriers if 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 people can tap into into that notion um, of, of unity. It's very difficult, obviously, because unity is a, is a very high a notion, but you you scale it down to what they under, understand. Well, yes, I mean, I I, I would agree. It's. Um... But there's a line, right, from Tibetan, uh, synthesis is unity must be created. So it is, a, it, it is a task to create the thought forms that would allow this um, path, the energy of unity, the, the, the building of unity. Yeah, and, and, I, yeah. And, I, and I think there's these principal thought forms like um, thinking about unity. And then there's obviously the detail. There's the detail as to how to manifest solutions um, in the complexity in the complexity which, which our humanity is, and that requires a lot of detailed people. Um, those are projects, then, right? So, the the concepts and and the the, the notion of reality to to get people to think more in line with reality that life is a unity. It's it's a continuity as well, and and that the the separation is an artificial man-made construct. Um, to help bring those principles onto the onto the mental plane, um, and, and then they filter down, and, and then obviously you you have your outer servers who who help put that actually into practice and to create re real projects of solution um, on on the on the physical plane. And there are many businesses doing that, and many NGOs and charities who who take those thought forms. And actually make them a reality on the physical plane. So, so there is a continuity of work. I know a lot of people struggle with that. So, how you know it seems okay? We think, and and you, you don't immediately see a con concrete effect. And that's where I, I guess that the faith—it's a kind of faith um, that energy does follow thought, and and that you do create an impact. And if you just think of, of that physics, the quantum physics idea that, that the observer affects the subatomic particles, that's already a proof, um, been proved by, by science that the observer affects the subatomic particles. So we always already have the recognition that thought has an impact. And so we need to, we need to have the faith that, that what we think actually has an effect and that what's happening out there in the charities, NGOs, and also in the public sector to an extent, is, is really the effect of higher energies influencing um, those people. I will unmute Christine. Yes, hello. hello. I 
Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Okay. I can't have you skip over the fact of the sixth ray influence being that that ray is supposedly going out of service, I think it is playing itself out in this separateness, in this fanatical behavior that we see. On the other hand, I do know that we have reached critical mass of the 7 billion people here on Earth. So that effect hopefully is counteracting what is going on. I would say besides politics, we do need to see what's happening here in organized religion. It has a very big effect on how people have a world view. Uh, I participated in a program with the University of Michigan, and I was the only theosophist, non-sectarian person there. They had no idea what I was about. Any comments, <laughs> please? Um, yes, uh, it, it's, a, it's a very valid point. Obviously, religion is, is one of the key areas of, of conflict. We see that, you know, if you just look at Christianity, the, the various sects within Christianity and denominations, etc. So it's really splintered, and, and that demonstrates um, the separate uh, thinking of of, uh, of of these leaders. Um, it's it's not it's not so so easy because um, we tend to think of religion as as being more emotionally driven, um, and and philosophers and scientists. Um, are more conceptual and, and on on the mental plane. So when we talk with talk to people about religion, um, it's it's I find it very difficult. So I've, I've had some a couple of experiences, and particularly the Christian thought form is tremendously powerful. Simply, and and I was in this for a while because they have this notion of the false prophet. And as soon as you try to talk to them about something that doesn't agree with their belief system, they think they're talking to a false prophet. And, and that makes it very, uh, very difficult to, to connect. But I think you, you can approach the problem from another angle. And I think most people who, who are truly religious um, do agree with, with, with the one humanity. You just mustn't talk about um, specific religious ideas or contradict their belief systems because that can um, can be inflammable and can be destructive but in, ter in terms of unity um, I, I think you can talk along those lines and I think you can make most religious people think that um, there should be a, a religious tolerance that there should be a tolerance of, of the different ideas of, of the different religions and that that should be accepted and that there should be a working of, of those faiths and, and, and a unifying of, of those faiths, even if the, the detailed beliefs um, remain different. Well, there's always a higher and lower aspect, but my thinking, okay, I am now trying to think through the rays. I'm wondering if it is really a determinism that it explains how people behave. Well, well, if you think about how people behave, again, it, it goes to back to, back to evolution, and you, you understand the constitution of man with his with his physical, emotional, and mental body. That those three bodies um, and and their their content their content is actually the consciousness content of, of the human being. And and what is in the three uh, the three atoms is 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 basically the subconscious, so the whole life history of of the individual. And so any person is a function of their past. And depending on the quality of the the matter they have in their in their three bodies, determines their ability to respond um, to to vibrations and at which level they respond. So when you say um, people you know, respond or don't respond, um, it might be that, that they are in, in that lower emotional nature, which is basically repellent, um, a lot of hate, hatred, lot, lots of um, I'm the victim type attitude. 
um, you, you just have to have a different approach for those, those people, understanding that, that they're at a different point on, on the evolutionary path. Uh, it's, very, it's very difficult. When, when you talk to any individual, you have to realize they're an individual, and you have to assess where they are and from which angle um, it's best to approach them. And good, Sheldon. Yes, well, thank you very much for this um, <clears throat> this great overview and conversation, Daniel. I, I wanted to pick up on this one aspect of what you were talking about and uh, somebody was asking questions about, and this is kind of looking at things from the world of business. And um, as we know, one of the ways we see the future present is we just look for these, we, we look for the examples. <laughs> Use religious language. Frankly, it's kind of, kind of little, little tiny pieces of the kingdom present. So let me give you let me give you the major example I'm thinking of. In 2007, a remarkable book was written by a Raj Sisodia professor. Um, well, he's now at Babson, but uh, called Firms of Endearment. You perhaps have read the book, or others have heard about it. This was a study of all the fir of, of whatever firms you could find. This is publicly owned companies in the United States. In this case, the startup has gotten much bigger now. Of companies who are who are loved by all their stakeholders, not just shareholders, but by by employees, by by customers, by the communities, um, et cetera, et cetera. And they found uh, about forty, and they're companies like. Um, Whole Foods, you know, I know they've recently merged again, but if you just take a look at Starbucks or Panera Bread, now under new leadership, but FedEx, Chipotle, you know, Costco, you go a few Southwest Airlines, et cetera. And um, what they, what he found was very simply that these companies um, the, ha, have four qualities to them. First of all, what they have done is they have change the nature of their purpose from being a major focus on profit to serving all the stakeholders. In other words, the whole thing is on providing products and services which serve the good in all stakeholders. Second thing is just looking at all those stakeholders and making sure that the company is really doing that. And there's a lot of different kinds of surveys and that kind of stuff that go on and out. Third, the third aspect of this, very simply, is, is the culture itself. They have built a culture basically on, on the, uh, based upon purpose and on service and on love. It may, be, may not be called love, it may be called teamwork. It could be, it be a unity kind of orientation, but there's a very strong culture. And obviously the leaders of these companies live those values. They live the purpose and values. So um, this became a small movement back about 2011. I was gathering about 40, 50 companies talking about this. It's now spread fairly, fairly wide. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an example, I think, of companies which other companies will look at, even GE will look at this and say, well, you know, <laughs> this is difficult for us to, to take on all of this, but they have adopted uh, several different aspects, particularly of the stakeholder model for this. So what I'm saying is there are people in companies, there are leaders of companies who are actually moving in the direction that, that, that we're talking about here. And when you see a company like this, when you don't see a company like this, I'll give you the example we saw in the papers recently, Uber. Most of you are familiar with this, <laughs> this car driving model here, uh, has been pilloried because of how they treat their people, how they treat women, and how the board talks about, about things. And um, there's a movement now just for people to, act, I mean, Uber's a very nice uh, convenience, I know, for many people, but just don't use don't use the uh, the service. So my guess is what we're going to see are uh, more companies moving in this direction as the people inside them are either founded this way or the people inside them grow up and become leaders and find a way to compete effectively. One more point I would make: these companies had a better shareholder price, the ones publicly owned uh, publicly owned than than other companies that did not did not operate in the same way. That has not been picked up yet by the by the stock analysts, so it's still the, the, the usual nonsense on a, on a more gross level. But there is a movement uh, across. And I would just mention the fact that in, in when you take a look at companies that are in, um, not in the United States, most of you know about, I uh, think you know about Tata, you know, in, Italy, in, the, in India. 
Uh, yeah. Unilever is a yeah. example. Yeah. Study that one. IKEA, you know, BMW. They are, these companies are doing some marvelous things, and there are many more that have come to the fore. Now, these are big and well-known organizations, but they provide uh, the kind of positive model and image that we need and we can see to say, let's go in this direction. And the language can be very much the language that, that works in business today, not so much about competition. Uh, although I like, I like the phrase competition cooperation. Cooperation is now a, now a nice move. So maybe I talked a little bit too long here, but I just want to make the point that there are there are examples. We need to study these things, and and there are ways we can support them ourselves. And this will become the, the trend. There's no, as you're kind of indicating, there's no way around this short of, of you might say, the more or less the end of life as we know it on this planet. We must cooperate, and love must rule. Well, enough for me for now, anyway. Yeah, th thanks very much for your comment. I, I do agree with, with what you have said. It, and it is promising. So, Alex, Alex, I'm a bit conscious of the time. We have 15 minutes, uh, 15 minutes left. Yes. Yeah, there, there are uh, more raised hands and uh, more, uh, um, questions coming in the feed. But... Um, I think we should move towards uh, the meditation and do our work meditatively. Just one uh, request coming from the audience, if you, Daniel, could share the script of your presentation that we could post uh, on the site together with the recording of this webinar. So it's been very appreciated what you shared. Yeah, I'll send you the, I'll send you the script and you can post it. Thank you. So please lead us in the meditation. Okay, so the, the meditation we'll, we'll do is the letting in the light using the cancer seed thought. I build a lighted house and therein dwell. I'll lead you through the, the various stages. And <clears throat> excuse me, just one second. And we'll say together uh, the group fusion the lower interlude and the great invocation. Letting in the light. We affirm the fact of group fusion and integration within the heart center of the new group of world servers mediating between hierarchy and humanity. I am one with my group brothers, and all that I have is theirs. May the love which is in my soul pour forth to them. May the strength which is in me lift and aid them. May the thoughts which my soul creates reach and encourage them. Alignment. We project a line of lighted energy towards the spiritual hierarchy of the planet, the planetary heart, the great ashram of Sanat Kumara, and towards the Christ at the heart of hierarchy. Extend the line of light towards some Shambhala, the center where the will of God is known.
high interlude. Hold the contemplative mind open to the extraplanetary energy streaming into Shambhala and radiated through hierarchy. Using the creative imagination, endeavor to see the three planetary centers, Shambhala, hierarchy, and humanity, gradually coming into alignment and interplay. Meditation. Reflect on the seed thought. I build a lighted house and therein dwell. Precipitation. Using the creative imagination, visualize the energies of light, love, and the will to good pouring through the planet and becoming anchored on Earth in prepared physical plane centers 
through which the plan can manifest. Use the sixfold progression of divine love as the sequence of energy precipitation. Shambhala, hierarchy, the Christ, the new group of world servers, men and women of goodwill everywhere in the world, physical centers of distribution. Lower interlude. Refocus the consciousness as a group within the periphery of the great ashram. Together sound the affirmation. In the center of all love I stand. From that center, I, the soul, will outward move. From that center, I, the one who serves, will work. May the love of the divine self be shed abroad in my heart, through my group, and throughout the world. Visualize the downpouring spiritual inflow released from Shambhala through the hierarchy and streaming into humanity through the prepared channel. Consider how these inpouring energies are establishing the pathway of light for the coming world teacher, the Christ. Distribution. As the great invocation is sounded, visualize the outpouring of light and love and power from a spiritual hierarchy through the five planetary inlets, London, Darjeeling, New York, Geneva, Tokyo, irradiating the consciousness of the whole human race. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of men, 
let the plan of love and light work out, and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks to everyone. Before we announce our next webinars, I want to invite uh, Daniel and Estrovich to make another announcement. Um, some of you might remember earlier in the year when we were announcing our year plan, we shared one of the ideas that's been suggested through the survey that we did last year during the Scorpio Sagittarius period. And there was the idea of forming um, communication task force was suggested. And so um, I invite Daniela to share the announcement. Okay, thank you, Alexander. Um, may I, okay, I may share my screen. Okay, so this is uh, an announcement for the translation task force that we would like to put in place uh, for the um, translation of some of the Ageless Wisdom teachings into modern world uh, language. So, um, as as we know, as students of um, Ageless Wisdom, we are frequently challenged to bring closer to people with whom we get in touch the immense knowledge dispensed through theosophical writings and teachings. We are often faced the, with the need to break the barriers of mental and emotional constructs acquired through various forms of education, be it school, family, history or story, belief systems, or just common and popular creation and sharing of ideas. We cannot but observe that some of the terms 
create an immediate mental as well as emotional resistance among those of our brothers and sisters who are immersed into an inherited understanding of symbols and ideas, a perception established through crystallization of societal structures and maintained by the current state of our civilization. However, our experience shows that allowing ourselves more freedom in finding new forms to express the essence of the teachings helps us to remove some of the obstacles that lay between truth seekers and sources of the ancient wisdom. We know from the teachings that disciples are required to modify, qualify and adopt the divine plan to the realities of own environment looking for adequate ways to express the essence of hierarchical messages. Moreover, we have been instructed that the task of communication is one of the most important functions of the new group of world servers. Thus, we invite you to join our new forming virtual group to venture translating the ageless wisdom into modern language of meanings. We will be looking into ways of expressing the ageless wisdom terminology with energy and rhythm more corresponding to modern seekers on the path. So if you're interested to join, please do email us and um, my address will be put into chat windows for you to copy it. So and um, some of possible activities include translating the key terms of the ageless wisdom traditions into the language of modern meanings, creating an adequately expressed message of the purpose of the 2025 initiative, and disappointing glamour of the cloud that blocks perception of the ageless wisdom in the modern world. So do please join. Send us an email if you are interested. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. And please join our coming webinars on July 25th. Uh, we will continue the project of meditative support of the thought forms of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And at the coming Leo New Moon webinar, we will focus on Goal 12, Responsible Consumption and Production. And the coming full moon uh, webinar will be uh, on August 5th. And that's going to be uh, on the topic of spiritual leadership with uh, Lorraine Flower from the United Kingdom as our presenter. Thank you very much. And let's sound together Gayatri. Muted. Unmuted. O thou who gives the sustenance to the universe, from whom all things proceed, to whom all things return. Unveil to us the face of the true spiritual sun, hidden by a disk of golden light, that we may know the truth and do our whole duty as we journey to thy sacred feet. Oh.